Welcome to Occult of Personality at occultofpersonality.net. Thank you for listening. This is a Cult of Personality podcast, episode number 98, featuring an interview with philosopher, mystic, essayist, and lecturer Neil Kramer, also known as The Cleaver. I'm your host, Greg Kaminsky. Thanks again to the subscribers of the Occult of Personality membership section who fund each and every show. If you haven't already, please consider supporting this show with a subscription to the Occult of Personality membership section. For only $7.95 per month, you'll receive access to all the exclusive recordings, including the archive of old episodes from 1 through 41. The link to the membership section is on the sidebar of the occultofpersonality.net website, or just browse to occultofpersonality.net slash membership. This episode of Occult of Personality podcast is also sponsored by generous donations from listeners Steve, Dave, Quinn, and George. Thanks again for sponsoring this episode. If you'd like to sponsor a future episode of the show, simply click the PayPal donate button on the website. Donations of any amount are appreciated. Now. In episode number 98, I chat with Neil Kramer. Neil is a philosopher, mystic, prolific essayist, and lecturer. You can find his website at thecleaver.blogspot.com. You can also find his extensive collection of audio recordings at cleavermedia.blogspot.com. Neil's areas of exploration include human consciousness, metaphysics, shamanism, systems of control, systems of liberation, and the nature of reality. In this recording, he shares his thoughts about his investigations into these subjects in a very open and personal manner. If you're familiar with Neil Kramer, you already know you're in for a treat. For those of you who aren't familiar with Neil, I think you're going to enjoy this very much. Neil Kramer, welcome to the show. It's so good to speak with you. Hi, Greg. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. So I'd like to start out by having you tell us a little bit about yourself for those who aren't familiar with you and your work already. Okay, well, I would say that I am basically somebody who focuses on metaphysics, consciousness, um, shamanism, mysticism, the occult, systems of control, systems of liberation, um, and empowerment, essentially. Uh, my chosen medium is typically the written and the spoken word. And um, in recent times, I've been sharing my essays and interviews and so on on my website, The Cleaver. And that's been up for probably uh, four or five years now, something like that. And I also attend conferences, I do workshops, I um, speak in the UK, uh, I've spoken in the US quite a lot, I've recently moved to the US in May, so I've started to um, get involved with the network of uh, events and people and practices and systems over here, so that's been really good. Um, as to how I got here, probably, like most people, it's something that is just seeded within you from an early age, really. So from my personal uh, path, I was always uh, interested in existence and the fact that we just show up here and we're thrown into this uh, realm, so to speak. And uh, it seemed for quite a while that I was the only one who seemed to be at all interested in that fact. And as to what we are and what we're doing here and who we are and where we came from and all that stuff, initially... Um, my research and study into that was just completely private, completely personal, sat in libraries, reading philosophy, psychology, later on spiritual works, texts, occultism, metaphysics, and so on. So I probably spent a good decade just studying that on my own. Um, and then as time went by and as I got older and a little bit more personal freedom in my life to move around a bit and spend a few pounds and so on, um, I started to bring that into actual 
felt experience, as we say, i.e. I started to move the theory into practice and visit certain sacred sites, um, get connected with real human beings and speak to them. Because I guess if most of your research is on uh, the screen or in books, that's great. But it's very much a one-way system, that. Um, plus the fact that, particularly in philosophy and spiritual works, most of the people who uh, penned most of the major and influential texts are all dead now. So um, it's nice to meet somebody who isn't uh, dead. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, as time goes by, um, these things uh, started to really solidify into particular fields and I realized quite early on um, and fortune is one word of describing it, synchronicity perhaps is another, that um, consciousness really was was the game. It was all about consciousness as, as that word is quite prominent now and that seemed to underlie everything and the nice thing about being around in these days is that because now of the internet, certainly from probably the late 90s, 2000 onwards, there's such a wealth of information that you can sift and filter and study and collate that um, what previously would have taken many decades in libraries and you know an extraordinary amount of personal time, you can get to things quite quickly. And not everything is on the internet, of course. Not everything is, is, is quality that is there, and some things are simply not there at all. But what it does do is serve as a good kind of springboard to let one understand the broader themes and then delve into the things that are more appropriate for your personal path. So um, I would say that in a nutshell my angle into this was a philosophical and a spiritual one from the beginning really. And so most of the time when people describe me as I've become you know, uh, known in the, the underground or the counterculture or whatever is as a philosopher or a writer or a mystic or whatever and depending on where you are you get you know, just very straightforward things like Neil Kramer is a, a blogger and then other people will say he's a modern mystic and then other people will say he writes essays. You know, in the old days, a hundred years ago, I would have probably been more accurately, accurately described as an essayist, which has been my chosen format. But in recent times, I've, you know, started to acknowledge that people want to listen and people want to watch. So certainly for the last six months, most of my stuff has been dedicated as well as writing into video and film and um, audio work which which is great because it works for me as well and some some of the best uh, texts I've ever consumed have recently in the last few years been audio yeah. so to get an audio book on your portable player to listen to while you're walking around or driving around is, is excellent and I don't think there's anything wrong with that so um, that's that's something that people respond to and obviously YouTube and stuff is a bit of a mixed blessing because you can watch some great stuff on there but there's such a load of absurd nonsense on there as well and uh, you obviously also get this thing where everybody becomes um, a kind of commentator and a critic and a researcher very quickly so um, forums and comment threads and all the rest of it can be fascinating but extremely time consuming so that's an unusual thing that in recent times has, has come about you know particularly with people bringing books out if you get like 20 negative comments on an Amazon thread uh, you know that can really affect somebody's career I was reading an article on that in the New York Times recently um, I actually haven't published a book under Neil Kramer name. I've had other works out in the past under different names, but they were fictional and poetic works. Uh, I'm currently working on my first uh, serious text now that will represent the sort of backbone of what I've been doing for the last 10 years, uh, and that's in the pipeline, and I'm speaking to various people who are helping me bring that to fruition at the moment. Yeah, I think it's really remarkable. I know your work is quite popular on the Internet, and I enjoy reading your essays and, and listening to you speak. And I find it remarkable because, as you said, you're basically self-taught. You don't come out of any specific school or tradition. You're really like a self-made man. So I think that is really remarkable, especially in this field. It's not necessarily easy, and a lot of people have some sort of something they fall back on to rely upon, like that they're really standing on that's not their own specific work. 
Yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's an interesting uh, point you make because a lot of people will focus on a given topic, as you say, like megaliths or good GF or quantum physics or, I don't know, you know, Illuminati research or whatever, which is, which is cool and is fine and we need people who can help articulate some of these things and pin them down and do some, you know, alternative scholarly work on that. Um, from my perspective, understanding the broader themes and modeling different realities has always been my preferred um, endeavor, if you like. So it's always uh, time consuming to get into one specific thing um, at the expense of all the others. And it, for me personally, I have to be very careful in what I put my focus on because you can very much disappear down certain rabbit holes and find yourself becoming a, a, a kind of mini specialist in one topic, which I don't really want to do. What I, what I want to achieve is simply put as um, a reframing of what human beings actually are. So the basis of my work has been initially a realization that what we have been taught we are is absolutely from the bottom up completely incorrect and what we actually are as human beings is quite amazing and quite magnificent and so most of the work that I do is all really aimed at reframing what we are and what we're doing here and what I try to do is back that up with a level of academic or scholarly uh, work and articulation, try and be as um, refined and articulate and uh, eloquent as I can in that because I think that matters. The way you communicate shows that you actually care about it and your authenticity in what you're doing can be uh, felt in the words. So not just using long words and phrasing things um, impressively, which you know everyone can do that if they try, but actually trying to pin the topic down by filtering it using certain phraseology, certain words that people resonate with. And I think particularly at live events and at conferences, which I try and get involved in as often as possible, you can get a very immediate feedback from the audience. You know, when you stood on a stage with the lights on you and a microphone in your hand, it's good for the speaker. It sharpens your edge when you're doing that because you can feel the response from the audience. So even doing a show like this, I try and put the same sort of focus into that to, to as sincerely as possible share what is important, not just to impress people or switch them onto something or excite them about something that's mysterious, but to actually drill right down to what is real because the crux of my work is what is real is the exciting thing. And when people begin to um, acknowledge and realize at a deep insightful level that the universe is an infinitely mysterious and wonderful place it takes away a lot of the um, repression and a lot of the despondency that is um, clearly in the mainstream culture is, is rife with it although they try and sedate us and move us away from that but also in people who focus almost exclusively on the conspiracy, the shadow, the dark side, if you're left with any doubt or fear or whatever, I just think that's kind of like just the old way. It's just yesterday's news that I just think it's horse shit really. So I also try and instill a little bit of empowerment into everything that I do and give people the inspiration that they have the equipment inside them already to do whatever they need to do and to free themselves to live a better life and to express themselves and I think when you put those three things together you also get what everyone wants which is joy and happiness and fulfillment so those things are very much a byproduct of doing the right thing or as the old Taoists would say you know uh, the Vedic philosophers is, is walking your path and when you walk your path things start to fall into place but it can be a, a time consuming and slower than expected journey sometimes um, so what I try and do is only from my own personal path because that's all we ever have really is just to share our journey not make any absolute empirical objective statements because perhaps you know in this world there aren't any really it's all a kind of subjective reflection nevertheless there are some pivot points if you like some reference points that we can all relate to and when you 
you know, hold that frequency when you ring that note out. Whatever anybody's chosen, study, research, uh, you know, thing that they're interested in, that resonance works. And you, you understand when you listen to someone or you read somebody, and I do this myself, there's a lot of people out there talking about very interesting things, a real miasma, a real plethora of stuff out there. And yet there's always only a handful who really, really resonate with me. And I respect those people and they do superb work. Um, and it always comes from understanding that it's not just, just the information, that the individual, how have they actually integrated it into their life? What has it actually done to that individual? How has it changed their consciousness? And you can tell that very quickly and very decisively by listening to somebody. Meeting them is even better, of course, because you can get it to it even faster. So personally for me, when I know that somebody is walking their talk, then the work takes on more gravity and more power. And so uh, as far as possible, I try and do that with what I do. So I'm never talking about something that I don't have a certain level of experience of. And it's not all abstract theory. Most of what I do, I have attempted and endeavored as far as possible and with as much humility as possible to do it in my own life. And people respond to that. And I get tons of brilliant communications from people who, you know, all different ages and genders and backgrounds and localities and what have you. And that's what people like, the fact that if somebody's out there who is giving you some interesting information, who is educating and informing and entertaining to some extent, because, you know, you've got to keep people um, engaged a little bit. However, what they really are interested in is the fact that a certain individual makes them feel that they can do it too. It's not about special people. It's about our resonance and whoever can hold that resonance becomes important because it inspires everyone else to know that they can do it as well. So the more that people do that and the less kind of cultishness we get and the less kind of uh, schisms we get in this alternative field, the better. So it is an individual movement of consciousness. Um, and it's through that, paradoxically, that we see the unity in this field, in this emerging sort of new field of real human consciousness that is totally um, liberated from the systems of control and is outside of the construct of the mainstream culture, uh, more and more people are definitely getting switched on to this. I know it's quite fashionable to say there's, a, there's an awakening happening, but there is, there simply is. Um, it's just that it isn't being televised or broadcast in the usual sense. It's out there in the ether, if you like. And certainly yourself, you'll be aware of that as you speak to people, but even just on the street and on the highways and in the country and in the cities and stuff, you can feel it and see it in people's eyes now and again. And certainly when I cast my mind back 20 years, it was it was not there in those times. But um, when I look around now, uh, just in everyday scenes, uh, you can feel that resonance. As you become more attuned to it yourself, you can feel it in other people. Um, the only difference is between those who... Uh, express it and those who don't is confidence really so um, the confidence to actually act on your philosophies and your spirituality is what is starting to change more and more people are saying I can't do normal anymore so I am going to take the risk um, balls to the wall time and let's go for it and um, that is an incredibly brave and courageous thing to do and has to be supported by everyone in the field really because it's, um, it's what it's all about but you raised many great points there, and actually I'd like to change the direction we were going to go in. Sure. And sort of get to the heart of the matter that you mentioned, and maybe we could talk a little bit about what we are not, because I guess that's probably easier to, to start with that, and then mm. what we really are. So in terms of human beings what are we not what are the great lies and falsehoods that have been perpetrated upon humanity in terms of our own self conception the greatest thing you can do to suppress somebody is take them out of context of what is real and when you do that with a human being the trick is to be able to instill a certain amnesia into the human mind that makes the human forget their lineage and forget their infinite spirit. And for those people who 
I always try and say this, for those who don't like spirit or divinity or whatever, just swap it with something else, with any sort of metaphysical language that works to you. The, the words are not important. It's, it's the, the meaning behind them. The, the pointer is always individual to the person. But I would say, if we understand that, in my view, um, there is no one single, empirical, objective, hard reality into which we all kind of get dumped at birth and it's like every man for himself and it's a case of try and make things as pleasant and agreeable and comfortable as possible that's that's the first misdemeanor really the first conscious misdemeanor that we see and that we brought up with and for most people it takes 15 20 years before you realize that that isn't really true What's different now is that you can communicate with other people and get other viewpoints that affirm that, whereas in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s, it was difficult to find other support on that fact. So unless you went out and did the study or went to conferences and stuff, because there was no communication, you would be forgiven for falling into the dream that life is this just big platform that you get dumped onto and good luck. So I would say what we think of as this default reality tunnel, and by reality tunnel I'm using this Timothy Leary, Robert Anton Wilson idea of unique perception that we're all, we all have our own individual reality tunnels, but there are group ones as well. So certain characteristic group reality tunnels where belief is required as a Christian or as a Muslim or as a naturalist, or as a determinist, or whatever, whatever that system is, there are group reality tunnels. And what I call the control system, or the old hierarchy, is probably an even better description, which I've started to uh, contemplate the usage of those words. Uh, what they try and do, and, and they are an aspect of us, which we'll come to later, but what they try and do is say that there is only one reality tunnel, and this is it. And it is a conscious emanation. It is a thought form that derives from what we could say is sentient design. So without going to where that ultimately derives from just yet, we can say that it's a kind of a signal that's broadcast. It's very faint, yet very definite. And over time, that signal gains um, amplitude because it's constantly repeated and aug augmented through billions of conscious nodes, that is, human beings. And that is what gives this reality its sort of irrefutable sense of hardness, of solidity, is the fact that it's being broadcast, not from a, an aerial or a tower on a hill somewhere, like in a science fiction movie, but it's actually being broadcast by human beings, billions of them. Now, the reality is, and particularly in uh, Vedic philosophy and Hindu spiritual traditions that are parallel to that. And of course, as we always hear these days in quantum physics, undoubtedly so, which again we can come to later, but we do not all appear to, say, to share the same um, platform, the same solid platform. And so this dream that we show up in is actually a construct. It is a physical, a literal construct that you can bump into and bruise your elbow on it if you bang too hard on it or bloody your nose if you really go for it. But it's also more fundamentally a metaphysical construct. It's an idea, it's a notion, it's a sound. And as I say, what gives it its consistency, because that is the only thing that marks this out as different from the dreams we each have each night, what makes this particularly different is its consistency. Every day you wake up and you walk into your living room or into your bathroom, it looks the same as the day before. When you look in the mirror, you look the same as you did the day before. And over time, you get a little bit older. And over time, your sofa gets a bit rubbish and it gets a bit tatty and you get a new one. But generally speaking, the trees are there, the street is there, everything is there. It's the consistency of it. And that consistency is held in place by consciousness. And so what a lot of the systems a lot of the mystical traditions, particularly sort of pre-Neolithic areas like 9000 BC, what they try and do is show us that this is a dream, it is an illusion, 
And it's not a bad thing because without having some sort of infrastructure in place, we wouldn't actually be able to navigate around. We wouldn't, this vessel of the body wouldn't be able to move consciousness around. So it's kind of, as I say, it's a default pattern. You don't have the ability right now to come in with your own pattern inbuilt. I think in you know, real antediluvian times, shall we say, you could come in with a lineage, a DNA frequency that would give you a particular reality tunnel focus that was more accurate than this one. But for now, we all come in completely blank with nothing, and you come in as a clean slate. And so there has to be some sort of default operating system running, and this is it. What the mystics showed is that if you want to change that, if you want to peep under the covers and see what's really going on, the first and most trying and most uh, difficult thing to do is to acknowledge that this is a dream. This is an illusion. This is Maya. This is the Matrix. And as you become to uh, understand that, as you become to realize the truth of that, um, something begins to happen, which is that the dream slowly starts to change kind of relatively to where you are in your consciousness. In other words, you begin to affect it initially on a kind of um, subtle level, but as time goes by, it becomes much more literal. And of course, in the occult tradition, this would be called magic, bringing about change in accordance with will. That's what magic is. It's changing the dream apparently from within the dream, but actually what you're doing is you go into a slightly different plane or dimension, or heaven, as they used to call it in, in previous millennia. You pop outside of the brain-mind complex, go back to spirit or higher self, and from there, just rewrite the code a little bit, rewrite the pattern a little bit. And as you start to do that, again, this observance that we are the dreamer and we are the dreamt, at the same time. And that is the fundamental observation in this. Understanding that you can be both the dreamer of this and the avatar in the dream simultaneously. And that is a distillation of many, many large works. As far as I'm concerned, if somebody said, what is this large kind of um, chunky doorstop book saying? It's saying that you are the dream and the dreamer at the same time. And that realization can only be brought into real inner knowing through experience. So as Morpheus says to Neo in the, the movie The Matrix, you can't really be told what The Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. And so it's very important to bring this practice about in the felt experience, the knowing of your own life. Um, so much of what I do is aimed at um, suggesting to people that this is a worthwhile activity, this is a worthwhile thing to do with your time. Yes, we have to kind of put bread on the table. We have to look after our friends and family and be human beings and kick back and enjoy ourselves. But that isn't why we're here, just to have a nice time and kind of uh, just wait and see what happens. The reason we're here is to edit this dream and to construct it in a more elegant and more creative and more um, genuine fashion. And it is my understanding, and this was hard won, this understanding, it wasn't given to me by anybody or by any text, this was, this was a felt experience, that there is a, a definite presence in this uh, world of ours where that default dream is purposefully designed to suppress what I describe as the organic ascendant human impulse from presenting itself. So most people lead grey, repetitive, unfulfilling lives by design of this dream. And so the first stage in changing that is to acknowledge that this is a dream. And you can't be told that you have to actually feel it inside, you know, as a complete and total knowing not as a piece of knowledge, that's different. Not as a piece of information that you read or somebody says to you on a radio program like this, but when you actually feel it inside. So sometimes when I speak of knowing versus knowledge, the difference is really that knowing is more akin to a feeling. It's a knowing that you love somebody. 
You can't have that as a piece of knowledge. It's a knowing. So knowing is, is more accurately reflected in feeling than it is in thought. So acquiring knowledge as an acquisitive process is fantastic for the biological unit of the brain because, again, we need that to do stuff, and it's a fabulous device to have access to. But that isn't us. Our, we are not our thoughts. We are not our brain. We are not the mind. The mind is the interface between the brain and, if you like, what we could say is the higher self. And so knowing is where you get a simultaneous contact with all those three things. The brain knows it, the mind knows it, and the higher self, the spirit knows it. And so knowing is contact with a thing rather than just representative information about it. So if I go into the Amazon to a remote tribe and say, here's a photograph of an apple, that's representative of the apple. It doesn't really give anyone any knowing whatsoever about an apple, none whatsoever. Whereas if I go to a different part of the uh, of the forest or whatever where there might be such a fruit and pick it off the tree and say, this is an apple, and they touch it and smell it and taste it, that's just sense data, but they get contact with what that is, and it becomes a knowing. Now, not all knowing is necessarily brought into being through physical contact with it. You can know something through mental contact with it or psychic contact with it. So this is the first stage in understanding the control system, is that it is a game of consciousness. It's not a game of physical repression. That is a symptom of the control system, not a cause of it. Just being physically free doesn't change a damn thing. So revolutions and uprisings and all that. A long time ago, I personally realized that that is all just puppet show, propagandized, um, you know, kind of civil charade, really. Those are strategically managed, as is everything else. The weapon you have is your own consciousness, because it remains indubitably independent all the time. There's no one can touch that. Nobody can do anything to touch that. Only you can suppress it. So the game is a, a very slippery and very seductive one that you are persuaded to suppress your own conscious growth. And that is the only trick they have against us. Um, so, yeah, understanding the control system begins with understanding that A, it is a game of consciousness, and B, what you're looking at is a default reality tunnel, a construct, a suggestion, an operating system that is delivered to you. This, the, the means of moving away from that is to understand that you have every right, and in fact it is your organic impulse to do so, to rewrite that operating system and establish and write your own. And of course we have to start with what we're given, but the faster and deeper we penetrate it, the more confidence and momentum we get in rewriting what is around us until you actually begin to reshape it, literally. And again, in um, historical times, our sort of wisdom ancestry shows that certain individuals were able to do that extremely quickly and could change physical uh, atomic structure of things because they understood this principle to a very, very deep level. And there's nothing fantastical about that any, anymore. Much of the new physics is showing that consciousness is intimately bound to the state of a given object or of a given configuration of energy. And in fact, what holds it in place to some degree is consciousness. And when you take consciousness out of the equation, it's, it changes the thing. And when you add consciousness back in, again, it changes the thing. So yes, it's, it's fashionable to say the new physics echoes the old mysticism, but it really does. It really does. And particularly in Irvin Laszlo's book, Science in the Akashic Field, you can get an excellent breakdown of that that will talk about, you know, Schrodinger and Heisenberg and uh, David Bohm and Niels Bohr and all the rest of them and give you a, a really nice distillation. If you don't want to read 50 physics books, which is a bit of a, a, bit of a thing to chew on, um, there's nothing wrong with letting someone else do the work in distilling that and then reading their conclusions. It's their conclusions, not yours, so you have to balance it and use your discernment and judgment and so on. But you do get the sense as you go through this that the most kind of maverick and pioneering and fearless um, scientists, particularly Bohm and Heisenberg and um, uh, Schrodinger, were very much... Um, had the guts, if you like, to acknowledge 
that what they saw was outside of their scientific paradigm and they were you know, compelled by themselves to some extent to deconstruct their own paradigm, to glimpse a real uh, view of the underlying architecture. So much of the philosophical contribution from them, of course, derives from what they did in the field of physics. But they infer, to me, real clear higher spiritual messages from the themes of what they're saying. And that is explicit with David Bohm and is more inferred by Niels Bohr. But nevertheless, that's what is occurring there. And as I've been writing about recently, even with Socrates, who was definitely regarded as a sort of major contributor to the modern scientific dialectical method, if you actually take a look into his life, a lot of his, um, a lot of his work and a lot of his uh, steering in where he was going was um, influenced by what they used to call the daemonic sign in those times, which um, was a daemon was basically um, a positive supernatural entity that dwelt between God and man and um, served, you know, in a benevolent fashion within the natural order, as opposed to a demon of Christian theology, which is a bad thing that's trying to trip you up all the time. And Socrates himself considered this daemon to um, guide him, and it was an inner voice that would dissuade him from taking certain paths and encourage him to take others, and he called it a gift. And he said, without that gift, there would be no poetry, no art, and in fact, no philosophy itself. And some of his Greek peers at the time thought he was crazy for even saying this, where others just nodded quietly and said, that's fine, but maybe you shouldn't be admitting this or writing it down. Yeah. So it's, it's unusual that this guy, who was guided by a daemon, um, actually was a major contributor to the, the modern scientific method of reason. Um, and he definitely saw this, not just this daemonic uh, influence, not just as simply intuitive subconscious faculty, which is what a, a psychologist or a psychiatrist might try and infer. He saw it as something divine. Clearly, he writes himself that he found it was of divine origin and quite independent of his own being, of his own thoughts. So when you really look at this, and my sort of forthcoming book is um, really trying to balance this to say we have these scientists, we have the philosophers, and we have the mystics, and when things were at their coolest, all these people kind of worked together to a large extent. And um, what's sad about today is that, although this is increasingly getting better, there's a, a great fragmentation in this. So the philosophers do their thing, the scientists do theirs, and the mystics do theirs, and things are turned upside down and inside out, and you lose the thread of it. Whereas in the old days, in the Druidic times, you would have guilds where these people worked together, and people had a clear, um, a clear focus on being scientific and being empirical in measurement and organization. And those guys were absolutely essential part of the guild, whereas other people, like the mystics, would go in and do the sort of pioneering scouting work and go into the vision of a thing. They couldn't explain it. They didn't know what it was, but they would go into it at a very, very sort of deep level. And um, in, in the same sense where I was talking about uh, um, Socrates earlier, you know, some surprising kind of stuff coming from him, to some extent um, you can see this in everybody who really has pioneered and, as we say in England, ripped up trees in their, in their field, done something important. And I discovered in my research that... Um, in, uh, in the sort of early 19th century, before Jung um, wrote any of his major stuff, he wrote um, a visionary document called Seven Sermons to the Dead. Mm -hmm. And um, it was really, it discovered, um, it uncovered rather a lot of Gnostic themes that were quite um, heretical and quite controversial at the time. And it contained highly mystical language. He was a very young man at the time, young, but super intelligent, super switched on. And it was a real work of mysticism. And he was attacked for this by his contemporaries, particularly uh, Martin Buber, the philosopher. And Jung defended himself and said, look, I'm a psychiatrist. I'm interested in facts, empirical material, and trying to make all this stuff comprehensible to everybody. But many, many years later, speaking in his autobiography, Jung said that 
and I quote, all my works, all my creative activity has come from those initial fantasies. Everything that I accomplished in later life was already contained in them, although at first only in the form of emotions and images, close quotes. So what Jung is saying is that I had the vision of this stuff, and it informed and seeded the work, the empirical quotes work that I did, but I couldn't articulate it. That is what mysticism is is getting outside of yourself and going to contact with a knowing that you may not necessarily be able to put into words. And this is what Jung did. And even in his autobiography way, he didn't have to say that because he was so renowned and so well thought of that he could have just swept that under the carpet and people wouldn't have really pushed it. But he acknowledged it. He made that bold statement to say everything came from those initial, as he calls them, fantasies because he couldn't put words to them at the time but everything that he did was contained in them as emotions and images. So this goes back to what I was saying earlier, that knowing is typified in emotional resonance, not thought. So that mystical impulse is not necessarily mutually exclusive to science or to philosophy. These things are just vibrations of the same perceptions, but at different stages. The mystics are the kind of scouts that go out the scientists then come in and measure stuff and quantify it and equate it with things we can understand. And the philosophers, if you like, balance the two and put it into some sort of overarching context. Your host is Greg Kaminski, and this is A Cult of Personality. A lot of what you say invokes the thoughts I had while reading a book called I Am That conversations with Sri Niskardata Maharaj. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I'm not familiar with that, no. It's mm. interesting. I'm like, I know about that. Yeah, it's I Am That. It's a fascinating book. Okay. He basically is a mystic. His approach was for people that came to him seeking enlightenment or illumination, mm -hmm. his prescription was basically to sit and ask yourself, who am I? Who am mm -hmm. I really? Who is this asking the question? And his whole approach was to in engender this perspective shift in people, just like it had in himself when he realized that he was not what he had thought he was, a, a physical being, a man who had born and who would die, that he was actually consciousness itself. Yeah, he was that, a dreamer. Yeah, so when he, when he recognized this, he went beyond everything, uh, beyond mind, I guess, in some mm -hmm. sense, and just was. And he had think, that knowing that you're talking about. I think that's the difference, just as you say there, the, the Taoist impulse, if you like, is to say we can detach from the dreamt, the dream, by understanding that we are the dreamer. And when we do that, everything takes on a certain vivaciousness and a certain clarity that makes it very beautiful and takes the pressure off basically trying to do anything and a lot of people stop at that point and they have these moments of nirvana or this contact with that or these moments of kensho in the zen tradition and they think okay fantastic i've figured it out right i'll stop there what i like to see in the works of others and in um, my own stuff is that that is a stage that is actually normally quite a natural stage in every single human being's life. It's not any kind of destination. It is a realization that typically would occur early on were there no suppression systems there. And so I think that, sadly, rather than just a handful of people being able to do that to any sort of fundamental, meaningful level, that is what everybody normally does. And that, in the golden days, if you like, uh, before things changed on Earth, or maybe uh, a, few, a few millennia ago, that is kind of what happened. Um, and so the control, as I say, is at a very fundamental level, which pins you down into mind, and mind becomes the prison, because that is your framing mechanism for yourself. Mm -hmm. And so... It's very important that people understand that there are techniques to get out of that and to change that, and it's different for everybody. Some people, as maybe somebody like Terence McKenna uh, or Timothy Leary might have said a, a short while ago, 
some people need a powerful psychedelic or entheogen or sacred medicine to achieve that, to knock them so hard out, to take the red pill and just melt this away. Some people can do it philosophically and can sit there and contemplate it and come to moments of realization from purely abstract means. Other people need to go out onto the mountainside and sit there for like a month in the cold and rain and, you know, just a little shack with a few provisions in it and really put themselves into a physical um, environment where the whole being is challenged from the core, really, in an old, old style shamanic vision quest. Mm. Bury themselves in the ground, all these kind of uh, extreme sports kinds of realization methods. Um, and so the meditation being another one which is a bit more gentle and easy to integrate into your life, but all are aimed at the same thing of showing the relationship between the observed and the observer and breaking down that polarity, that duality between the subject and the object. And that is the first stage in this, is to understand that the dream and the dreamer are the same thing. And as you begin to understand that, this basic dichotomy, this false dichotomy that there is a big platform out there with loads of objects in it and you're one of them, begins to dissolve a little bit. And as you go through life, you realize that essentially what we have is configurations of energy that move around in conjunction with consciousness. Mm. So if you're not taking part in that, if you're not creating your own reality, then you're really agreeing, you're consenting to just go along with someone else's. So it is a question of consent and of acknowledgement. And I must say that as I've kind of gone further into this, the ignorance of that is no longer any excuse of not being aware of it. So that sounds rather sort of um, paradoxical. It's a bit like driving into New York City on the wrong side of the road, which I've done once or twice, uh, being an English person. Uh, and if you get stopped, the fact that I'm on the wrong side of the road and I didn't know it is no excuse for me being persecuted, uh, sorry, persecuted, prosecuted by the cop on the, on the street corner. You know, that is the way it is. And my belief is that fundamentally everybody knows this is a dream and everybody at the deepest core level is fully aware of that. They just don't know what the hell to do about it. They don't know how to integrate any changes of that knowing into their life. And, you know, you look up from your own thoughts and the kettle's boiling and you're sister walks in and you you know you need to get your laptop upgraded and you go into work the next day and life's events suddenly take over again and you caught back up in the dream so the trick of the mystic is to retain this vigilance this rock solid vigilance throughout the day throughout the night until the dream that you have at night and the dream that you walk inside in the day there is the boundary softens between the two and you realize that the whole thing is one massive construct and it's only really illustrated when you go unconscious and when your consciousness changes as in sleep as in when you fall into that state or as in manipulating your consciousness through the things we spoke about earlier physically chemically um, you know electronically if you're using these kind of brain devices and stuff there's lots of different ways of stimulating that but you have to change your consciousness to see it and as I, as I mentioned that's different for everybody there's no prescribed best way of doing this um, if I were to run a school in, in such matters these days the first good few months would be in understanding the students different um, mentalities um, and philosophical um, articulations in their own minds and where they stand what their bearing is as a human being and then you would understand what is the most appropriate method for that student to begin to do this so whether we look at druidic shamanic um, hindu buddhist gnostic zoroastrian whatever they do share a set of core universal observations nothing is separate from anything else there does appear to be this field this kind of hyperdimensional medium through which everything manifests and fundamentally the experience of human consciousness is pivotal to that is very important to it and that stands the old 
physics on its head, really, which just says, look, this is a big machine, and you're just like a little thing that crawled out of the sea and just e evolved through natural selection to this point. Total nonsense. Total nonsense. That is just, you know, so absurd. It's just mind-boggling. What's important is, though, to be able to not just understand that theory but to actually do something about it so those traditions those spiritual traditions devised sets of techniques that had to be integrated into a disciplined system in your own life for maneuvering your consciousness in such a way that you could discern what used to be called ultimate reality primary reality and to be able to shape it more closely with your will with what you want to do, your intent. And that is the essence of magic, and that is the essence of mysticism, is to make contact with the underlying reality. And my book is all about that, and my work is all about that. And sometimes you do that, as you said right at the top of this uh, show, that you do it sometimes by negating things, by saying what ultimate reality isn't, what it is not, that it isn't culture, that it isn't television, that it isn't government, that it isn't atomic structure solely, that there are many other aspects to it. As you start to negate that, then you move to the balance point, to the fulcrum of it, where then you move into what it is. And that's a very challenging thing for most people to do. It's a little bit like looking someone right in the eyes and saying, what do you want to do with your life? It's a very difficult question to answer that. It's easier to say what you don't want to do, but there comes a point where you have to contemplate what you want to do, and equally there comes a contemplation moment in your own consciousness where it is appropriate for you to think, what is existence? And you have to do that through your own experience. So these systems that are all our heritage, all our wisdom heritage, people just like us have been through this thousands and thousands of times over many millions of years, I feel. Um, and they told us how it's done. They told us what it is. They told us how it's done. And through history, if it has not aligned with the dominant empire of the time, their thoughts and their accounts and their historical records are called myth or folklore or fable. And so we associate those things with fantasy, with what is untrue now. Uh, and that has to be overturned. And I think particularly, of course, people who listen to this show will have a good understanding of that, that a lot of myth is not untrue. It's not fantasy. They're not stories for children. It's actually something that had real physical manifestation. And historical records that we understand in the West are largely absurd, largely absurd. Um, the first guy who wrote the full history of Denmark was a guy called Saxo Grammaticus who was basically working for the Vatican and the Vatican said to him look we don't want any of that Norse mythology bullshit in Danish history so I want you to completely discredit them so Grammaticus said anything to do with Odin and Thor and all those guys uh, they were basically just black magicians who were conning you they were tricksters and they were heathens and they were not of the Lord and so it was already sanitized in the 13th century. And most people do not bother to look before that to see why that occurred and what was before it. So Norse mythology is considered fantasy to most European modern peoples. And in fact, there is much more to it than that. And it, a lot of our real true history lies in that mythology, in that folklore. Yeah, that's an interesting point you bring up. And I know for me personally, my own perspective on this, I, I find it fascinating. To me, the, the mythology I'm familiar with is typically what I would describe as keys to unlocking a, a human consciousness and behavior. And I find it fascinating the way that other cultures, mythology, it's in, in the eye of the beholder, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Like we yeah. call, We might call it mythology, they may call it religion. And I that's think right. that's a really important point when you think about Judeo-Christianity in particular. Absolutely, because yeah. Because during that Christianization the... process in Europe, yeah. the Romans called Christian mythology, a uh, Christian history rather, myth, and the Christians called Roman history myth. Mm. So what you didn't like, instead of calling it history, you called it myth. And that was going on 2,000 years ago. But I think it's important today to reckon, and I know 
obviously people like Joseph Campbell in particular bring this point to the surface yes, really course, well. Yes. Yeah. That myth is really what we want. We don't want necessarily literal religious history if we treat it that way the minute some archaeologist comes along and says well wait a second this doesn't match up with what what's written down and everything Sorry. goes to shit <laughs> but if it's a myth then you can interpret the meaning a little bit more find out what it means to you personally how it affects you as an individual not just what's the story that's right well it's, it's a very simple thing to to understand the importance of myth and history as two things to um, enable us to plot what actually occurs. To keep historical knowledge and illuminating wisdom in the hands of the few, whatever reigning empire is, is there in the day, and let's take Rome as an example, they knew that all they had to do was keep the population ignorant, basically unable to read and write, illiterate, and also, in, in those days, as also now to some extent, unable to gather even to discuss matters of uh, uh, spiritual or metaphysical nature. Um, only the, the elites, really, had access to education that was bringing any sense of basic literacy or numeracy or historical awareness. Mm -hmm. For everybody else who couldn't read and write, and this was everybody in England basically up until a few hundred years ago, um, for everybody else, all they had to do, uh, all they had access to to preserve their historical record was, was spoken or musical words. So we get folklore and folk music. And for this reason, you know, we have to be very careful not to dismiss these things, folklore and folk music, as just, you know, silly fictions. Um, whereas in natural language, if you say such and such, well, this is what actually happens here, oh, that's just folklore. Well, that's just a myth. The very use, the very modern use of those words shows us how that's been rewritten out of the modern language now, which is, which is bizarre. So it's a, the most stunning control mechanism, really, is the ability to keep people ignorant. And it's fashionable to be ignorant. It's fashionable to say, who cares? What's that got to do with my paycheck? Or what's that got to do with me getting my 500-inch flat screen TV, you know, what's, what's it got to do with anything? So the empire knows this and it just quietly maintains this ignorance throughout the centuries. And, you know, the idea that it's uh, these secret societies and stuff is, is shocking to most people and ab absurd and ridiculous to others. But when you just do a little bit of research and look into it, as I said earlier, you see these public pantomimes are really just socially engineered things to give the appearance of change but at a higher level nothing is changing and what the empire is doing is just changing its robes it's changing its language changing its religion to accommodate the next um evolutionary stage of it of its domination the real control and that stratification of knowledge and that esoteric history of humankind is exclusively retained by the empire and this always makes me think of uh, Philip K. Dick's observation, the empire never ended, which is absolutely true. The empire never ended. There was only one empire, and it stretched from Neolithic times right till today. It's the same single edifice. Neil, you have a lot of projects going on. Tell us a little bit about how people can get more of your material. The easiest way is to go to my website, The Cleaver, which is thecleaver.blogspot.com, which contains all my essays of the last four or five years, basically. It also contains links to two projects. Uh, one is the audio cleaver, which if you prefer to listen rather than read tons of text, that's cool. So there is an audio book read by me of all the key essays that I've written from 2006 to 2009 covering many of the topics we've talked about in this show, and you can get that as a digital download. Um, there is also uh, live audio recordings from a tour I did with my friend and colleague KMO uh, that we did in uh, Canada and the States in 2010, just right at the start of this year, which contains lots of interesting topics about transition, about consciousness, 
about social change, about esoteric material, about conspiratorial material, all that kind of um, stuff is there. Um, that, again, is available from that website. NeilKramer.com is, is up there at the moment, but it's just got a holding page on there. So if you can't remember any of this stuff, just put my name in .com and it'll link you to it. Um, I'm currently, as anyone who's following my work knows, uh, involved in getting this book out at the moment. So that's consuming pretty much all my time. But along my travels, I'm basically taking my little sort of HD video recorder and grabbing loads of material and slowly editing that down into um, various DVDs covering some of the things that I uh, focus on. So there's going to be a lot of new material available in the new year, which uh, I think um, should be interesting to anyone uh, who's uh, captivated, uh, vaguely interested, new, old to this material. I hope there'll be something there for them to, to take a look at. So the cleaver.blogspot.com and there's cleavermedia.blogspot.com, but you can get everything from that first site is all linked on there videos audio interviews essays to read and, and lots of other uh, juicy stuff also yeah definitely check it out great material you won't be disappointed very uh, engaging and i applaud you as well for really uh, capitalizing and taking advantage of the whole new technology the internet audio files making things available for people in various formats yeah. is really really cool yeah thank you yeah well it's um it's sort of incumbent on us to use this technology while we've still got it around so uh if you want to read or listen or watch you know there's various different ways to do that so yeah check it out thanks again neil brilliant thanks see you later bye in the occult to personality membership section I talk with Neil Kramer about control systems, exploring the hierarchies of meaning and deeper implications for humanity. Join us for that fascinating conversation in the Occult of Personality membership section. The link to the membership section is on the sidebar of the occultofpersonality.net website, or just browse to occultofpersonality.net slash membership.